Hi, my name is Ko and I am with the Institute of Electronics at Graz University of Technology. In this short clip, I want to talk about the frequency spectrum of some common signals. After watching this video, you will understand how the frequency spectrum of a rectangular, a triangular and a trapezoidal signal looks like. As long as we deal with single sinusoidal signals, the world seems pretty easy. For instance, a 1 MHz sinusoidal input signal causes a frequency peak at 1 MHz. But what if the input signal is arbitrary? How does the Fourier transform, for example, of a rectangular function looks like? Basically, the continuous time Fourier transform is a simple integral which transforms a finite time domain signal into the frequency domain. So let us solve it. First, we need to set the borders of the integral appropriately to our input signal. Finding the primitive function of an exponential function is quite simple and after that we must insert the borders for our integration variable t. Now we can use Euler's definition of the sine function to rewrite the exponential functions into a sine function. Finally, we expand both nominator and denominator by the term tau half to obtain the same denominator as the argument of our sine function. This special sine x over x function also has a name, the sinc function. This result here shows us how the frequency spectrum of a single, non-periodic rectangular pulse looks. It's a simple sinc function. However, Analyzing a single pulse with a spectrum analyzer can be tricky. Therefore, we can put this single pulse into a periodic series, a Fourier series. Without diving into the world of signal theory, you can see the result of a periodic rectangular signal here. There are two major differences. First, the amplitude of the spectrum of periodic signals is way higher than from a single pulse. Second, the periodic signal produces a countable amount of single spectral lines. Please do not get confused as these values are not the values shown on the display of a spectrum analyzer. The plot within the yellow box shows how the sync function looks. Zeros can be seen in regular distances. Compared with the previous result, we now only consider its absolute values. Additionally, we multiply our result by 2, as it does not make sense to consider negative frequencies. Please keep in mind that you will see single spectral lines on the display of a spectrum analyzer and not a dense spectrum as shown here. More interesting is probably the logarithmic plot of the frequency domain, where we can see a minus 20 decibels decrease of magnitude after the first corner frequency. The value of this corner frequency gets to lower frequencies the longer the on time of the rectangular input is. Alternatively spoken, the shorter a pulse is, the more spectral components can be measured at higher frequencies. If you measure a rectangular signal with a spectrum analyzer, you may see a second corner frequency. This corner frequency depends on the edges of our time domain signal. As in our example, both rise time and fall time are infinitely short, we do not see this second corner frequency in this plot here. But as rise and fall times become longer, spectral components at higher frequencies will be suppressed with 40 decibels per decade. Now to the triangular function. We can calculate its spectrum in the same way as we did with the rectangular function. The only difference is that the integral becomes harder to solve. As this is not a math class, I will skip the explanation of the calculation here. Please stop the video if you are interested to calculate the spectrum on your own. 
you can solve the integral easily by partial integration. However, I want to discuss the result of this calculation. With the triangular function, we will obtain the sinc function squared. This means that the amplitude of the frequency spectrum will decrease with 40 decibels per decade after its corner frequency. This brings me to this final slide. Here, I have marked the 40 decibels decrease in amplitude of the triangular function. One could also say that the triangular function contains two corner frequencies at the same frequency point. Finally, I want to spend some words on the trapezoidal signal. As the trapezoidal signal can be seen as a combination of rectangular and triangular signals, you will find the second corner frequency depending on the edges of the signal. If both rise and fall time are infinitely short, you will get the rectangular signal back again. On the other side, if you increase both rise and fall time to a maximal extent, you get a triangular function. The spectrum of all three types discussed today are summarized in this single formula here. Okay, we are now here at the Institute and I've brought some devices with me. So first here, we have a pulse generator. So this is basically a signal generator, which gives us a rectangular pulse train where we can adjust some properties of that rectangular pulse train. So for instance, now the high level of our pulse is set to, to one volt. The low level is set to minus one volt. We can adjust both rise time and fall time. And we can set here the periodic time to one microsecond. And we can also set here the pulse width, which is set to 100 nanoseconds now. So we have a duty cycle of 10%. And we are now applying that signal here on that cable. And the signal now comes to this device here. So this is a power splitter. So half of the power is going here in this direction and the other half is going here in this direction. So here we have our scope where we are analyzing the signal in its time domain. The scope is set with a 50 ohms input impedance and the other half of the wave is going here in this direction to our spectrum analyzer where we are analyzing the same signal in its frequency domain. And also this device here has an input impedance of 50 ohms. So the whole system here is a 50 ohms matched system here. And by this power splitter, we are losing a strength which on both devices here. So of course, when we are applying a wave here, half of the power is going this direction, half the power is going this direction. So as both devices gives us the value in volt, we can see a minus 6 dB decrease. So I've shown you that I've set both high and low level to one volt, so plus one and minus one volt. Uh, but here on the scope, we can see that the signal goes here just between minus 500 up to plus 500 millivolt. And as well as here on the spectrum analyzer, we can see an attenuated value. So the value you can see here on the screen isn't the real value of what we are applying here with our parts generator because the wave is first attenuated by our cable here, then sees an additional attenuation by this pulse splitter here. Then here there is an additional minus 20 decibels attenuator, so just to keep things safety. And for in addition, there is another DC block device here. So just to keep in mind that the value you can read here on the screen of our spectrum analyzer isn't the true value of what we are applying here with our pulse generator. But I would say, let's zoom a little bit in and let's start with our experiments. Okay, we can now see here, I have set here with our pulse generator a pulse periodic time of one microsecond, 
which corresponds to a base frequency of one megahertz. And we have set an on time of 100 nanoseconds. And we can see this behavior now here in its time domain. So we can see that this pulse here is repeating every microsecond here. And if we zoom in in its time domain here, we can see that one division is equal to 500 nanoseconds, which means that we have here a 100 nanoseconds on time, which brings us to a duty cycle of 10%. And as our base frequency is set with one megahertz, we can see here in its frequency domain with our spectrum analyzer that our base frequency here is located at one megahertz. And you can now see here single spectral lines. So the second peak here, which is called the second harmonic. So by definition, the first peak here is, so the base frequency is also called the first harmonic. And this is a second harmonic, which is located at two megahertz. And we can see here the third harmonic, which is located at three megahertz. So we can see here, depending on the base frequency, we can see here multiple overtones just multiplied by a constant factor from our base frequency here. And in contrast to our theory part here, I have plotted an, an broadband signal here. But as mentioned beforehand, we are only seeing some single spectral components now. And now let's move on to a second experiment. So now let's play a little bit around with all those parameters here. So at first I would like to adjust both rise and fall times. And maybe it's better to see it here in time domain if I zoom in here to the edges here. So these are the default values now. And I've prepared some a signal with longer rise and fall times. So as you can see here, now the edges are smoothed here. So this is our default case, and this is now the case when we have longer rise and fall times. And what do we expect to see? And this brings me to this slide here. So we have seen here in this sync function here that by setting both rise and fall times equally, we keep things simple and here we can see that the second corner frequency, it, this corner frequency depends on the rise time now. So if I will increase the rise time, so it, if I will make it longer, then here the denominator gets higher and therefore the second corner frequency will now be shifted to the left. And let's hope that, we'll all, <laughs> that we will also see this behavior here in its frequency domain. So this is not a default case. And now I will increase those timings. And yes, now here this minus 40 decibels um, decrease of amplitude corner frequency is now shifted here to the left. So this behavior we have seen beforehand. And by increasing rise and fall times, we are now shifting that corner frequencies here to the left. Okay, so now let's continue with our third measurement. So I would like to adjust now this factor tau. And by adjusting tau, we are adjusting the duty cycle of our signal here. And so in its time domain, it's clear. So I will just here set, uh, no. <laughs> okay, now I have the correct setting here. And um, you will now see if I increase the on time here, indeed, so it's not so hard to think what happens here in its time domain. So um, we are adjusting the duty cycle here. But what do we expect to see now in the frequency domain? So we will observe multiple effects. So first here we can see that the factor tau is here in our formula in the denominator. So by increasing tau, overall the amplitudes will go up to higher values. So let's check that out if we can see this behavior in the frequency domain. So I will now increase the duty cycle. And yes, definitely. We can definitely see here an increase of the amplitudes. 
So I will now increase it once again, and yes, so especially here in the base frequency, we can see that increase here. A second effect I would like to measure now is, I've written here that the first corner frequency depends on tau. So if I will increase tau here, because tau is here in the denominator, the corner frequency must now shift to the left. So it must decrease. And let's check that out if we can see that here in its frequency domain. Uh, Okay, this is probably hard to see now, but in theory we should observe that behavior here. <laughs> okay, and now you may have recognized if I am setting here our pulse generator to approximately 50% of duty cycle, we can see here that all those odd harmonics, they are going down in level, so they are decreasing. So I will now further fine tune my timings here. And yeah, okay, I guess I cannot achieve better results with this pulse generator here, but I think you can see here that every second overtone here is decreased massively. So this is because and if we have an ideal rectangular signal with a duty cycle of 50%, we are only able to see odd harmonics. So we can only see here the first harmonic, the third harmonic, the fifth harmonic, the seventh harmonic, but we won't be able to see a second harmonic, a fourth harmonic, a sixth harmonic, and so on. But now let's switch the settings back to the default values. And now let's go to the last experiment for today. So now I'm not changing the parameters here, but I'm changing the parameters of our measuring device, of our spectrum analyzer. And I would like to demonstrate what happens um, with when I'm choosing the resolution bandwidth too high. So first, if I will move the resolution bandwidth to lower values, we can see here a decrease of our noise floor because then less total power is located within one filter bandwidth and thus leads to a decreased value of our noise floor here. But on the other hand, if I increase the resolution bandwidth, so all measurements done before were, were done with a resolution bandwidth of 20 kilohertz and I will now increase that value, we can now see here the shape of our filter bandwidth. And if I will now further increase here, our resolution bandwidth, so at one megahertz, we have now set the resolution bandwidth equally with our base frequency of our applied signal. And here you can see what happens, but if I'm choosing now here two megahertz, you will definitely see that we are increasing here the amplitudes because now by choosing two megahertz we have definitely more than a single spectral line within our filter bandwidth. Therefore more than one spectral line gets integrated in this filter and thus leads to higher values here. So physically we, ha we only have single peaks but just if we are choosing the resolution bandwidth of our measuring device too high we won't see those single spectral lines anymore. You can also see that by choosing this value too high, our problem becomes, it seems to be a broadband signal. So now it looks like what I've plotted here in our theory part, but this is just because more than one spectral line is now located within the filter bandwidth. And if the filter bandwidth now moves on and moves on, and steps on, every time there are more than one single spectral line located within that filter bandwidth, and therefore we can see here this broadband signal here. Okay then, I hope you've liked the clip about the frequency spectrum of periodic signals and that you have learned something new. But anyways, thanks for watching.